Okay, we might get started. Uh, my name is Dr. Omar Korshid. I'm the uh, Federal President of the Australian Medical Association and I'll be your Chair for today's meeting. I'd like to welcome you all to this AMA member webinar on the GP role in the COVID-19 vaccination program. Uh, in the spirit of reconciliation, the AMA acknowledges the traditional custodians of this country throughout Australia, everywhere we are today, and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are with us today. Uh, just a, a couple of points to start with. Um, this meeting, this webinar is being recorded uh, and uh, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions by popping them in the chat. We've already got some questions to cover and we'll be able to put those to our speakers uh, today. Any questions that we don't uh, get to, we will do our best to, to get answers from the department or from the AMA uh, and post them back to everyone uh, who is interested. Now I would like to uh, welcome uh, the many AMA members who've joined us for the webinar uh, and thank our representatives from the Department of Health, including Professor Michael Kidd, uh, who've uh, joined us to give us an update on the vaccine rollout as well as to answer some of the many questions that GPs have. 12 months ago, the prospect of a viable COVID-19 vaccine was a pipe dream and the governments were still coming to grips with this emerging pandemic. Our tools to fight the pandemic were limited to social distancing, hygiene, testing, contact tracing and supportive care for our patients. And although we've learned uh, a lot along the way since then, uh, we've done remarkably well. We're still uh, really dependent on a vaccine program to take us out uh, to the other end of this. Sadly, so many other countries haven't fared so well. It's hard to believe that we're now on the cusp of rolling out not just one, but a number of effective vaccines that over time will help our community to return to something that resembles uh, the life that we all knew before. The AMA has consistently stressed the importance of general practice in any COVID-19 vaccine rollout and the Commonwealth has accepted our advice. I'm, glad, I'm really delighted to say that uh, well over 5,000 general practices, that's the vast majority of general practices throughout the country, have now lodged an expression of interest for the government's rollout, uh, which is a reminder of the commitment of GPs to their patients, their communities, and the pivotal role that GPs play in our health system. Yet getting the logistics right about uh, this program has thrown up many questions raising from, uh, ranging from how a steady and predictable vaccine supply can be managed, how can we get bookings handled right, how can indemnity be best covered, and in particular, the MBS reimbursement arrangements, are they sufficient? The AMA has worked really hard behind the scenes with government and with the RACGP to ensure that GPs are a central part of this program. We have particularly worked to improve the level of funding that was originally put on the table by government, and we've secured significant improvements by pressuring for things like the double bulk billing incentives, an extra uh, PIP incentive, uh, the after hours uh, items, and other things that make uh, this program viable for general practice. Bluntly, without the AMA, these payment arrangements would not have been achieved. A public discussion about funding in the midst of a, of a pandemic is really difficult to conduct, but our approach has ensured that five times as many more GPs have felt confident enough to sign up to this EOI than the government initially anticipated. We've now got to turn our minds though to ensuring a successful vaccine rollout, which is what today's webinar is all about. General practice needs as much information as possible and your feedback and your questions will help the Department of Health to better understand your needs as well as to further refine its approach. Before introducing Professor Michael Kidd to outline the details of the vaccine program, uh, we have received a number of questions from AMA members in advance of today that have been shared uh, with the department and Professor Kidd has undertaken to do his best to address the issues raised in those questions. Um, but as I mentioned before, uh, you can certainly open your chat box, add additional questions, and we'll do our best uh, to get through as many of those as we can in the time that we have uh, today. Uh, and I've also got some uh, questions that have already been submitted uh, to get through. Uh, so I'd please uh, like everyone to welcome Professor Kidd, who'll speak for uh, a short period. And then following him, I'll introduce our Federal AMA uh, Vice President, Dr. Chris Moy, uh, who's been uh, deeply involved in the negotiations uh, and in representing our profession uh, with the various government uh, committees that are involved in this rollout. Um, I'll, uh, we'll then get to the questions and uh, get through the meeting within the hour that we have. So over to you, Michael. Great. Thank you, Omar. Thank you, Chris. And thank you to Martin and the AMA team for organising today's uh, webinar and for inviting me to take part. 
as an AMA member of now 38 years standing, I've been incredibly proud of my AMA over the past year and the work that the AMA and the AMA's leadership have been doing uh, as part of the national response to COVID-19. So thank you, Omar, and thank you, Chris, for your incredible work that you're putting into this. Thank you to your predecessors, uh, especially Tony, the, the amazing work that he did. And thank you to everybody who's on the webinar today, the Doctors of Australia. Uh, thank you for all that extra effort you've been putting into protecting your patients and your communities over the past 12 months uh, during the pandemic. And as Omar has said, a big thank you to everybody who has responded to the expression of interest. Over 5,000 of Australia's 6,200 6, accredited general practices have put in an expression of interest, which is an extraordinary expression of, I think, a desire to be a part of this rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine, which of course will be the largest mass immunization program that our country has ever seen and indeed the world has ever seen. So I wanted just to give you uh, an update on what's been happening just over the last week because there's so much happening in this vaccine space. Uh, and then we'll get very quickly to the questions. With the questions, I will answer every question that I can and where I can't give you an answer uh, we will, I will let you know that we currently don't have an answer to that particular question, but it's incredibly important to hear the issues from you because this helps to inform the work which is happening within the Department of Health to prepare for the vaccine rollout. So please, any question that you have, please post it. Uh, and, uh, and as Omar said, um, they'll be shared uh, with the uh, Department of Health as well as uh, with the AMA. Uh, to help us with the ongoing work uh, that we're doing. So uh, as you all know, last, um, oh, sorry, I have to correct one thing on the, uh, on the invitation. I'm no longer the acting chief medical officer. Paul Kelly came back to work uh, yesterday, but uh, I've been in that role over the last uh, few weeks. Um, so I'm now deputy chief medical officer again. Uh, so uh, last Monday, uh, Monday of last week, uh, the Therapeutic Goods Administration provided the provisional approval of the Pfizer uh, vaccine, uh, the first of the COVID-19 vaccines to be approved for use in Australia, approved for use in anyone aged 16 uh, and above. Uh, the uh, TGA and the ATAGI, the Australian uh, uh, Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation are now working through the issues that they normally work through after a provisional approval has been granted to provide the advice on uh, is this vaccine recommended for women who are pregnant, breastfeeding, uh, planning to get pregnant, uh, the frail elderly at the end of their life uh, and others. And, uh, and this advice will be coming through uh, over the coming uh, few days. On Tuesday this week, the Prime Minister in his address uh, to the National Press Club announced the 1.9 billion additional dollars which are being put into um, the COVID-19 vaccine program around Australia, including the funding which will come through to general practice uh, through the MBS to support us in the work that we're doing uh, in vaccinating the members of our patient uh, populations uh, in our communities. Uh, yesterday, uh, the Australian government announced uh, securing an additional 10 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine. So we now have 20 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine due to come into Australia uh, throughout uh, 2021. That's in addition to uh, the vaccine doses for the AstraZeneca vaccine, which of course still hasn't been approved by the Therapeutic Goods Administration, but has been approved by a number of comparable organisations overseas. Uh, and the Novavax vaccine, which is still very early uh, in, its, uh, in its plans. Uh, as you'll know, uh, Australia will have, uh, if the AstraZeneca vaccine is approved, uh, this is going to be produced onshore in Australia through a licensing agreement with CSL. And this will help to shelter Australia uh, from uh, some of the uh, disruptions which we've seen in vaccine uh, supply uh, occurring uh, overseas. We'll be producing uh, enough doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine onshore to be able to immunise uh, the entire population uh, of Australia. Yesterday, the, the government also announced the communications 
uh, plan, uh, because it's going to be absolutely essential that we keep on the front foot with the communications about the vaccines uh, with the Australian community, but also with the people who will be delivering the vaccine program uh, across the country, which we many people are uh, taking part uh, in this webinar. Uh, that program also includes significant funding to ensure that the messaging is getting out to culturally and linguistically diverse communities uh, right across Australia and to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities uh, right across Australia as well. We need to make sure that we don't experience what we're seeing happen with the rollout in some other countries where uh, where uh, populations uh, which are disadvantaged uh, are actually not receiving the vaccine or not uh, presenting uh, to get the vaccine. We want everybody in Australia uh, to be able to get the vaccine, which of course includes people who don't currently have Medicare cards. The vaccine will still be available free of charge uh, to everybody who is currently in Australia, which makes sense for a major public health uh, initiative like this. Uh, the uh, rollout uh, will be happening according to uh, priority groups and uh, as you'll be aware the initial priority group 1A uh, is uh, the people who are working in quarantine and on our in our border forces, the people who are most likely to come in contact with someone with COVID-19. More than 1% of the arrivals into Australia are currently, uh, current arrivals are infected uh, with COVID-19 and so it's important that we protect those people and as we've seen with the cases just this week in quarantine workers in Victoria and Western Australia last week uh, in New Zealand, uh, this is a group which is at significant risk and of course then at risk of transmitting COVID-19 uh, to other people in the wider community. Also in priority group 1A are healthcare workers who are working in the front line in roles which make them more likely to come in contact with someone with COVID-19 and also the people who are working in residential aged care facilities and disability care facilities across the country uh, and the residents uh, of those facilities. Obviously the highest mortality rate we've seen in Australia has been among uh, residents of residential aged care facilities. Uh, that will include the staff of aged care facilities will include anyone who is working in those facilities, which includes the GPs who are attending uh, those facilities. We hope that um, GPs will be able to uh, turn up when uh, the aged care facilities they're looking after uh, are having their residents uh, and other staff uh, vaccinated. Uh, we'll then move to, uh, to group 1B, which includes those aged uh, 70 and above, uh, throughout our community, the rest of our healthcare uh, workforce, uh, people who have uh, health conditions or disabilities, which put them at increased risk of COVID-19, uh, increased risk of serious illness, and, uh, and a number of essential workers, uh, our um, defence forces, our police, our fire crews, our ambulance crews, uh, and interestingly, our meat workers, meat processing factory workers, because we've seen, of course, significant outbreaks occurring in those settings uh, in Australia. Uh, so the, the initial 1A group, uh, people will be receiving the Pfizer vaccine because that's what we have available uh, now. We're expecting the first doses of the Pfizer vaccine to arrive in the country over the next couple of weeks. TGA will then go through its process of checking the batches to make sure that there's been no um, problems uh, during the uh, shipping of those vaccines uh, out to Australia. Those vaccines will then go out to 50 or so hubs around Australia and people will come into those hubs to get their vaccines. We'll have in-reach groups taking the vaccine out to aged care. Uh, we hope that uh, come early March, uh, if the AstraZeneca vaccine has been uh, approved uh, by the TGA, uh, that we'll start to get the overseas supplies. And so we'll be able to start uh, vaccinating people in the 1B group. And this is where general practice comes in uh, to play. And we'll be rolling out through general practices sequentially uh, around the country uh, over the uh, months of uh, March and April. Uh, and, uh, and during uh, the latter part of March, we hope that the onshore production of the AstraZeneca vaccine will start to roll out as well. So they're the early phases and then people will get their vaccines progressively, mainly by age groups uh, throughout uh, the rest uh, of the year. The, uh, the phases are not gonna be, we do phase one, 
complete stop move to phase uh, 1B, uh, they'll be rolling sequentially uh, out um, because we recognise that it's going to take time in different parts of the country to cover everybody who needs uh, to be covered. We're working closely with the states and territories to try and streamline that process as much as we possibly can. So there's lots of lots of issues I could talk about, but a couple of things. Uh, everyone who's going to be involved in rolling out the vaccine uh, will be required to undertake the online uh, training which is being provided. That online training uh, is specifically to assist people with the multi-dose files that these vaccines are expected to come in, uh, to make sure that people are aware of the need for two doses of the same vaccine. You can't get one dose of one, one dose of another. Uh, to make sure that people are aware of the reporting requirements. Uh, as of yesterday, legislation was passed by both houses of parliament to require every vaccine uh, which is uh, administered in Australia to be recorded on the Australian Immunisation Register, something that the AMA has been advocating for over the past year with the uh, flu vaccines. And so that legislation has been passed. It will start with the COVID-19 uh, vaccine. We know that this is a problem because last year we administered 18 million doses of the flu vaccine, 9 million were recorded on the Australian Immunisation Register. There's 9 million doses, we don't know what happened. But it's very important with this COVID vaccine uh, that we know uh, who's getting the vaccine, make sure people are getting their second doses, uh, make sure that we're getting equitable spread uh, right across the country, that we can identify populations which are not getting the vaccine so that we can target uh, those populations and make sure everybody uh, is covered. There are still though a lot of uncertainties and challenges ahead. And there are lots of questions which I'm sure people may want to have answers to, which we just can't answer at the moment. We don't know the duration of protection of each of these COVID-19 vaccines. We don't know when and if a booster is going to be uh, re required. Th these are things which are going to become clearer as the vaccine vaccination programs roll out uh, around the world and the research is being carried out. We don't know if the vaccines which are being licensed in Australia are going to prevent transmission. What we do know is the Pfizer vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine in the clinical trials have been very effective at preventing serious infection with COVID-19 and death, but we don't know if people will still be able to be infected and have asymptomatic infection and therefore able to transmit uh, to others. Uh, we are seeing some early data coming out of Israel, which has uh, had a very rapid mass vaccination program. They've currently vaccinated 37% of their population. They are already seeing a very significant decline in serious illness and death and hospitalization from COVID-19 in their over 60s uh, population, which has been their target uh, population. So that's great, but, uh, but we need to watch and see if that's uh, going to be replicated in other countries. We don't know what happens as new vari variants of concern appear. We know that the vaccines that we have appear to be effective against the so-called UK and South African variants, but there are other variants appearing. We've seen a new variant which has appeared in Brazil, it's now in Japan. Uh, we're yet to see how effective the vaccines are against uh, that variant. It is a bit of a race with this vaccination program to get the world vaccinated before COVID-19 has the chance to develop too many uh, new uh, variants. So uh, it's a challenge. We don't know if previous COVID-19 infection provides immunity. Uh, and whether that influences vaccine effectiveness. So there's clinical trials still underway. Uh, we don't know about the use of vaccines in children. We won't be recommending the use of vaccines in children, but obviously that means it makes herd immunity much more challenging when we're not immunizing 20% plus uh, of our population. And of course, in many other countries, uh, the percentage of uh, children is, is much higher than it is in Australia. Uh, so there are still uh, still many questions which uh, I hope we'll be able to have answers to over the coming months. As Omar said, it's been an amazing 12 months uh, of vaccine development and of science by amazing researchers, AMA members here in Australia, and, uh, and also by colleagues overseas. So I'm going to stop there, Omar, so we've got enough time to get some questions. 
Fantastic, Michael. Thank you very much uh, for that. And uh, I've already written down a whole pile of extra questions, so I'll keep you busy. But before we do that, I'd like to hand over to uh, Chris Moy, a uh, general practitioner from South Australia and uh, my vice president at uh, AMA. Chris has been intricately involved in, in every part of this, um, of our, our input into this GP vaccination program, and he'd like to say a few words. Chris. Thanks, Omar, and, and, and thanks, Michael, for coming along. Uh, look, my, my job is just to give you a quick sense of what's been transpired and the AMA involvement in ensuring essentially that GPs have been involved in this rollout and sort of the intense work that have been going on to really resolve a lot of the key matters, many of which you've actually brought up in the chat. Um, first up, can I thank you for all the people who've sent in some really important suggestions along the way. We've had some great input. And I've got to thank particularly the, the, chair, the head of our AMA CGP group, the G, head GP group, and the deputy chair, which is uh, Richard Kidd and Simon Torveson. They've been fantastic. I'd also like to just uh, make this, uh, we, Michael and I were talking about the wonderful aspect that there's been a lot of, for example, retired doctors who've actually rung in to join the fight to the AMA in our local office. It's been actually a really lovely aspect to it. Look, I'll, I'll, I'll call a spade a spade. I'm a very, very uh, a blunt speaker. One of the things that we had this is just so that uh, we, we address some of the things that we are aware that some, some members and some doctors have had some reservations um, and have, some have been frankly unhappy with some of the proposals that have been revealed so far. Um, look, can I just say, uh, Michael and we were just talking about the fact this has been a very fast moving thing. This is not something, it is like, um, I think it's been described like uh, trying to build a plane while flying it. And I think this is an extremely difficult thing to do. And I think what I'd like to say is that, you know, we've had a, you know, I've had a complaint by one member who's, who, who decided that we're going to resign because they kind of thought that we'd all sat in a room a few weeks ago and uh, the AMA and the RSEGP had, had sat there with cigars in a dark room thinking up these item numbers to make it more difficult for GPs. And I've got to say, it was no, it's been nothing of the sort. First thing I'd like to say is you cannot assume that GPs have always been in the picture for being central in the COVID vaccine rollout. And, and, and this is where Omar and the AMA have been very strong in standing up and saying that GPs have to be part of this. We are able to do this and we have, we're the ones to bring the patients with us because I think, you know, we're getting all these questions and our trust is really important. And I think I was talking to Danny Byrne, I see on the chat, um, he was comparing to the disaster in New York uh, where really they decided not to go by family family doctors and have tried to run it through hospitals and it's been a complete disaster with physical distancing and things like that. They just, they just can't get it done. So look, essentially what actually happened was the AMA was approached about three weeks ago. Uh, I can't go into the details. I can't give you the, the, the gory details, but essentially just prior to a meeting between the AMA and the RSCGP and the AMA have been, um, and, and the RSCGP, Karen Price has been great. We've been working together recently. And we were put with an initial proposal for support for GPs in the rollout. And, and frankly, at that time, it was not adequate. And there were significant aspects that uh, had not been considered from our point of view. And we basically said it wasn't going to work. And frankly, over the last next few days on advocacy on the part of the AMA and the RACGP working together with excellent responsiveness from both the minister and the department, there was a significant increase in the quantum and nature of support. Um, and there was also very good progress and there continues to be good progress in addressing key aspects of concerns that uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the proposals and the rollout. And, and this has been extremely intensive work. Um, and the, the sort of matters that have been brought up are issues, obviously the level of funding, but also increased support for rural after hours, which was a critical thing for us because we realize that many people are gonna have to do it after hours to make this work, staffing and so the rest of the health system can go, keep going. Uh, issues about, you know, being able to make sure our nurses or other, maybe some of the doctors we've talked about who want to come out of uh, retirement to help out can actually be the providers of their vaccinations. Issues such as, as co-claiming, supply of consumables and uh, PPE, simplifying the red tape. And we saw the initial EOI, which was a bit over the top, and the department have taken that on board. And we've been working to simplify aspects and clarify things. And also really bits that uh, we brought to the table, which issues are making sure the education consent indemnity have been really considered, and they are still matters of serious consideration. And we've been really strong on behalf of you, you as members with both the minister and the department. What I'd like to say then is that, you know, despite this, there has been, you know, and I, I have heard the undercurrent that maybe because of the lack of information that there has been concern about what's been going on. Can I say to you, part of it's because we're not able to discuss a lot of stuff in public and it's not reasonable to, because, and a lot of it's still moving. But 
can I say straight out, there has not been a conspiracy set up or sell out, okay, on general practice. AMA has been very much there standing up and I think Michael would know that I'm pretty blunt in meetings and discussing things. But essentially, uh, the first thing is the AMA, Omar has been very strong about the role or need of GPs to be out there and part of this. We have intervened and worked very hard to greatly improve the starting position of support and this continues. And more importantly, this has been done, and this is really important, this has been done with a much bigger picture in mind. Um, I totally understand, having been a practice owner in the past, that many of you are run you're running businesses, but you need this to support your patients. And I also understand in the past, you know, sometimes you have been frustrated about the way things have gone, um, you know, and, and there have been reasonable reasons to be upset. But I think I would like you to look through a different lens, and that is essentially that of not just the government, but also the community and your patients who are really desperate for things to improve. And consider that there are also other groups in primary care, such as pharmacy, who are hovering at this moment in time, watching what's about to happen. And in this time of need, in this global health crisis of our times, the COVID vaccine roller is the chance for general practice to really cement its place as the cornerstone of health in the hearts and minds of the government, the community, and most importantly, our patients, um, now and into the future. And that has ramifications for a whole number of other things. And I'll put it another way, what, you, know, you know, some of our patients who have gone through actually so much, many of them have lost jobs, they've lost their businesses, will really find it hard to understand any complaints by us about new funding arrangements to give them an essential vaccination, which the government is providing. So um, that's why we have not been out there We've been very strong about having a positive story about this because any negative story to some degree, and it's not a matter of shutting it down, it's a matter of not undermining not only the vaccine story, but also the perception of general practice. Um, so for this one, I would like you to understand the stakes. It is a moment in time. It is an incredible opportunity to prove that general practice can do this for the Australian community. Instead of talking about it, we can actually do it and maybe get back to the roots of, you know, what we signed up to become doctors for. And all I can say is that, you know, Omar has very much been at the front of that. I have had that in mind and I hope that you can come on that journey too, because we really would like to do this and actually make this succeed. So uh, that's really the bit I'd like to say, and then we'll move on to questions. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. Very uh, clearly uh, enunciated and um, certainly we are I think all here today because we want uh, this vaccination program to work. Now we have a whole pile of questions. Uh, I'm gonna put them to each of you, um, Michael and Chris, and if I could ask you to be fairly brief with your responses so that we can uh, get through them uh, as many as we can. Uh, the first one um, to, to Michael, uh, why the focus on accredited practices only? And is there any possibility for those that are not eligible at the moment to join in the program in phase 2A, uh, et cetera? Thanks. thanks, Omar, and thanks, thanks for the question. So the original focus is on accredited practices, and one of the reasons for that is, of course, um, practices which have gone through accreditation have had external assessment of some of the key elements of delivering the vaccination program, including uh, their, their uh, infection control measures, their cold uh, chain uh, measures uh, and uh, and so forth. So uh, that's the reason behind accredited uh, practices. Of course, the majority of general practices in Australia are accredited. We've had an accreditation program uh, for the last uh, quarter of, uh, of a century. Um, whether there'll be any uh, movement towards uh, opening up the program to uh, additional practices, I can't say. Uh, at this point. Uh, there, we, we are restricted uh, in the number of sites where the vaccine can roll out by the packaging of these vaccines. So the Pfizer vaccine, uh, which comes in very large uh, packaging, uh, will only be run out of between 30 and 50 hubs, uh, which are being organised with the states and territories uh, around the country. Uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine, if it's uh, approved, it still comes out in multi-dose uh, vials. And uh, so it, we, we have to make sure that we don't uh, have any wastage uh, of those uh, doses, uh, because we do obviously want to immunise as many people as quickly as possible uh, across, the, uh, across the country. Uh, thank, thank you, Michael. Just, just a comment from me, I guess, given that uh, you are going out to, to pharmacies that aren't accredited general practices, 
uh, and the EOI process itself is quite detailed with a lot of uh, overlap with accreditation. It does seem that an unaccredited practice, if it ticked all the boxes in the AOI, would still be a, uh, an entirely suitable venue for vaccination. And I'd encourage you to take that on board. Um, go to the next question, the national booking system. We've got a um, question, what, why, uh, what is it gonna look like? How's it gonna work? I know this is a work in progress, uh, but if I could maybe um, get Chris to comment on, on where you understand it's up to and then Michael as well, uh, just briefly, thank you. Um, look, we, we, we've been very worried in, this is the sort of thing we've been applying, worried about the, the concern about trying to build something that was not going to fit in with normal workflow and our own clinical systems and particularly in the time that, that was required. So my understanding now, it's going to be uh, essentially going to be something uh, through the health directory service, essentially where people can actually find a practice and, and uh, you know, find out and, uh, what, and see whether they fit the criteria and then use the normal booking systems of general practice at this stage, which is the way, I mean, it's not high tech but it's the way we work and it would fit with our flow without having to go through some new technology that doesn't plug into our system but uh, uh, Michael does that sound about right to you? Yes so this this will provide if you like an electronic front door for many Australians to be able to uh, get information about the vaccine to check their eligibility to get the vaccine now or when it's likely that their uh, turn will come and to provide them uh, a, a listing of all the sites where they can get the vaccine uh, in their local geographic area and if possible a link directly through to the online booking system for uh, practices which have those or the phone uh, numbers of course for the practice so they can ring up uh, and make an appointment. We are encouraging people um, to uh, book uh, both their first appointment and their second appointment uh, to get their uh, vaccines and obviously we're encouraging that to happen in the same place uh, to promote continuity uh, of care uh, for, for the people getting the vaccines. Uh, thank you very much. A few questions about uh, vaccine availability um, which I might take the liberty of, of answering. So, so just to clarify your comments and please, Michael, if anything I say here is wrong, uh, jump in. So expecting that all GPs will be using the AstraZeneca vaccine rather than Pfizer vaccine, unless uh, there's some sort of bump in the road in the approvals process. Um, and that availability in sort of late March, certainly local production late March, uh, in importation sometime in March, but dependent obviously on international factors. And GPs involvement in vaccinating will be in phase 1B and then beyond. GPs receiving the vaccine as a healthcare worker, the average GP at this stage also 1B, uh, but I think you indicated before that GPs who attend residential like aged care facilities would be in phase 1A and could access the Pfizer vaccine through the aged care facility or perhaps some other um, mechanism. Does is that, is that sum it up? Uh, yes, just, just a couple of, of clarifications. Uh, 1A uh, will probably also include those GPs who are working in uh, general practice led respiratory clinics who are doing large uh, numbers of tests uh, and also those GPs who are working uh, possibly also in emergency uh, departments uh, uh, that includes uh, colleagues, especially in, in rural areas. Um, a lot of that's still being worked out through the states and territories because they're, um, they're going to be running most of those sites. Uh, you're quite right. Um, if the AstraZeneca vaccine is approved, that's the vaccine that we expect will run out through most general practices. Although there may be some of the general practice respiratory clinics or Aboriginal community controlled um, health organisations which are involved in 1A. Again, that depends on the negotiations happening with the states and territories. There'll also very likely be some regional centres included uh, in each state and territory under 1A. Thank you very much. Um, the question now about uh, pharmacists. So there's been a few on the chat and also in the pre-submitted questions. So. The AMA was uh, led to believe that pharmacist involvement would start at, at phase 2B, the general community rollout. Uh, it's subsequently become clear that it is phase 2A. Um, and uh, I guess questions would be, um, are pharmacists going to be held to the same standards of practices as GPs, um, including their ability to respond to the very rare uh, adverse reactions, but also in particular, the physical requirements, which are quite onerous for general practice. And, and certainly there's not too many pharmacists I've seen that have got the kind of facilities that you need to 
to get a decent volume of patients through. So are the standards going to be the same and why the focus on, on um, pharmacists so early in the campaign when well, it's possible that we won't even have all GPs involved at that point? Yes, so I, I'm yet to see the, um, the draft for the expression of interest for the pharmacies, but, uh, but we do expect that there'll be significant uh, requirements uh, on pharmacies as there are on general practices, uh, which are going to be rolling out um, the delivery of the vaccine. Okay, and, and just for the information of everyone here, I have written to the Minister um, either yesterday or today, uh, just making our views clear that uh, we expect the government to uh, be focusing on general practices uh, before uh, pharmacies and that uh, any situation where um, pharmacies were involved and GPs were not allowed to be involved would be, would be unacceptable uh, uh, to the AMA. Um, question on money, which I think Chris has pretty much already answered, but um, basically the requirement to bulk bill um, for some practices, obviously a, a difficulty, um, plus uh, the complexity of the EOI, the, um, the issues with uh, a, a patient that's not normally a patient of the practice coming in and having to collect all the appropriate data on that patient is something that's pretty hard to imagine would be workable within these item numbers. So. Uh, what is, um, perhaps Chris first, what's your response to that uh, comment? And um, uh, and then we'll go to Michael. Yeah, to be frank, that's been day one from us, in fact. Um, we understood that really the, the, the actual item numbers currently, COVAX, are going to be, importantly, out of the 80-20 rule. Okay, that's important. They're not excluded. They're separate to the whole process because really they're kind of this special item number to provide the vaccine, and, and it is the policy of the government to provide that free. The question is, how does that fit in with a few things? Uh, what happens with uh, normal business? If it fits with normal business, you've seen somebody for something else. And also um, with other situations where there may be other things that you may have to care for for the patient or particularly more di difficult type situations. So we have had you know, even discussions this morning with the department about this issue. and. And, and trying to clarify the matter of co-claiming and when that can occur in the circumstances. Certainly the way it's going to look, I suspect is going to be, COVAX's item number is going to be outside of 80-20. Uh, any items are definitely going to be, other items it's co build are going to be within 80-20. So that's going to put some uh, border at it, which you'd expect because you wouldn't be expecting to see ridiculous amounts of other items co build with COVAX. And then, and then, you know, our, our position would be that really, you know, things are documented properly and they're medically necessary um, and they would, uh, you know, they're not, they're not a situation that they're just being derived, um, you know, ab abnormally from the, the COVAX item numbers that would be, seem appropriate. So that, that would be our position and that's where we're working through with the department at the moment. Okay, uh, anything to add there, Michael? Are you ha happy with what Chris has said? Yeah, no, happy with what Chris said, that's fine. Um, next question, uh, do you expect there to be a new EOI process for uh, phase 2A, so those practices that haven't put up their hand as yet, because clearly there's a, a pretty onerous requirement at this stage, will there be a, the possibility for them to participate uh, down the track, given that you've already got over 5,000 uh, EOIs? No, thank, thanks, uh, Omar. So the department has been putting out uh, a series of uh, frequently asked questions um, for uh, GPs and others. These are available on the health.gov.au uh, website. Um, and, uh, and we had uh, uh, one of these on the expression of interest. We're encouraging uh, everybody who may be interested in either joining in in 1B or 2A or beyond uh, to complete the expression of interest uh, which, uh, which closed this week. And so I expect that there'll be a significant uh, proportion of the 5,000 plus uh, practices which responded to the EOI uh, who will be uh, more keen to join uh, as we move into 2A and, uh, and beyond than uh, 1B. And uh, on the 1B numbers, uh, we, we were led to believe the government was thinking around about 1,000 sites uh, for 1B, presumably to, to, to um, recognise the uncertainty of supply and making sure that uh, we get this program rolled out with a minimum of, of uh, mistakes and errors. Um, but um, uh, clearly got a lot more interest than that. And, and GPs are seem to be motivated by treating their own patients. Uh, 
So if you've got vulnerable patients who might be eligible under 1B, but you're not a vaccination centre, it's not a great thing for your patients to have to go to another practice. So is there is the government thinking of uh, opening up above that thousand or is that sort of where you're looking at this stage? So I think uh, Minister Greg Hunt has mentioned 2000 uh, sites eventually um, over the past uh, week and uh, the, 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 there are a number of rate limiting challenges here. It's the uh, number of doses coming into the country and the way that they're packaged uh, with these multi-dose vials. There's the logistics of distributing uh, the vaccines and making sure that we maintain uh, the cold chain, uh, which uh, is less of a challenge with the AstraZeneca vaccine, obviously, than uh, for the uh, Pfizer vaccine. Uh, it, it is likely that for many uh, of us, we will have um, uh, patients who uh, will be in the, those earlier um, phases uh, who will need to get their vaccine from somebody else. This, of course, uh, will include our patients in residential aged care facilities where we won't be involved in administering uh, the vaccine by their regular treating doctor. This will be happening through the in-reach uh, teams which are being organised so that we can vaccinate that priority population very quickly and hopefully prevent uh, a further um, outbreaks affecting our residential aged care as we saw in uh, the second wave. Um, thank you. I think Chris wanted to comment. Chris, uh, once you've made that comment, can you also, I'm not sure if you know about adverse event reporting, but a couple of questions have just popped up about that. Um, so if you could uh, answer that, if not, uh, Michael. Yeah, look, I was just going to just uh, deal with this issue about the fact that we've, there's, it's so great to see the number of people that put their names down for one, you know, for the, for 1B, but um, but there is going to be a limitation. I mean, it's only going to be, you know, less than 40% of those people are, groups are going to uh, get approved. The important thing that we've made to the department is, is really to, uh, you know, the, the, the rest uh, need to understand. And I think many of them are, actually understand that they put their, their names in really for 2B, 2A, really, <laughs> to some degree. And, and really that you're all wanted. And, and, and there's a real sense that everybody is needed for this. This is huge. This is Dunkirk. This is the biggest thing we'll do. So... Um, look, it's it's a massive thing. So if you can understand, we are very clear to the department. Like it's not just a matter of you're in and you're out. It's not like that at all. You're you're all needed for this huge push on. Um, just a very quick thing. Just can I just deal with that uh, adverse reaction thing? I haven't actually caught up with that actually, to be honest. But I want to deal with a, just a, a little issue with um, the uh, MBS items. We're working on those right now, and there was just this issue about this question about somebody. What happens if they find and collapsed afterwards um, and you know you had to do a bit of a recess and whatever I kind of I don't think uh, personally most uh, PSR people would be pointing at you if you're actually doing a, a recess on this person or something like that that, that you have to do a co-claim I'm not even I'm not even sure any of the hardest of units in in the PSR would be upset with uh, a co-claim in that situation if your patient was on the floor as long as, long as you keep a record I think uh, the PSR would say um uh, just on the size of the uh, task, Michael, um, uh, someone's commented that Rana McIntyre says that to get this done by October, it's 200,000 a day. Uh, I think CSL is saying they're producing a million a day, which, uh, sorry, a million a, a week, which if you do the maths, doesn't quite add up to getting the whole population done by October. So is that a realistic aim or is that the politicians being a little um, optimistic? Yeah, um, my maths is a little different to, to Raina. We, I've got to sit down with her and, and go through it. Um, my, mine is if, if we've got about 200 days to vaccinate people from uh, practically March to, to October, that's probably 100,000 people a day, but that's assuming that clinics are running seven days a week. So um, we assume that that won't happen. Uh, if we run about 2000 sites, it's about 50 people a day at each site, but some sites of course will be doing more and some sites uh, will be doing less. So the, the, the answer is probably somewhere between 100,000 to 200,000 uh, people a day and between 50 and 100 people. Uh, on average at sites. Uh, you know, some of the uh, sites the state governments will be setting up, you know, in their large teaching hospitals will be vaccinating large numbers of people uh, every, uh, every day uh, as they get their staff uh, and, uh, and others uh, immunized. So let's, uh, let's wait and see. I think, I think the maths uh, is, will, will work. Um, I just did want to touch though on the side effects as well, because part of the really essential work of therapeutic goods administration is not just 
the provisional registration, it's following up and monitoring uh, the safety and e efficacy and the side effects of the vaccines. And this is going to be an additional really important task for all of us uh, to make sure that uh, we're reporting uh, any side effects which occur. We do expect um, similar side effects to influenza vaccines with uh, uh, tenderness and discomfort at the injection site uh, for many people. We do expect that some people are going to experience fatigue and maybe uh, flu-like symptoms uh, after their, their vaccines. We have had reports coming back from the uh, North America and Europe of some people who end up uh, being bed bound for a day or two after getting their shots, which uh, can happen, of course, with flu vaccine as well. But we're very interested in the, the significant uh, adverse events. There's been very few adverse events picked up during the clinical trials and during the emergency rollouts in Europe uh, and North America. As you'll know, the one which has occurred that has caused the most concern is severe allergic reactions occurring um, in the uh, immediate period after uh, the vaccine. Uh, these have tended to have occurred in people who've had significant allergic reactions to vaccinations before. And this is part of the reason why it's so important that people are going to be uh, required to stay and be monitored for that important 15 minutes after the vaccine, which of course we already do for influenza. It does raise an important issue. Is it safe to vaccinate someone in their car and having them sitting in their car for 15 minutes? Uh, can you observe someone there? Uh, I'll leave that up to your, your clinical judgment. If you're running one of these vaccination centers, it wouldn't be something that I'd be comfortable uh, doing. Um, the, uh, obviously, the, the other uh, significant effects of some vaccines, the Guillain-Barre syndrome and others, uh, obviously, we'll, we'll need to know if anything like that appears. So uh, please make sure uh, that you are reporting adverse events like never before. Uh, thanks, Michael. Now, you, you mentioned flu vaccine. Uh, is there any more guidance as to co-administration or the gap that would need to be uh, between uh, flu vaccine and COVID vaccines? Yes, this advice has come out from ATAGI. Uh, it's on the uh, health.gov.au website, came out uh, over the last few days. Uh, we cannot co-administer the two vaccines. Uh, the recommendation is at least 14 days between receiving a COVID-19 vaccine and an influenza vaccine. This uh, means we're going to have to be a little bit nimble, uh, particularly because we will be rolling out the seasonal influenza vaccine uh, in April and May and June. Uh, and so uh, patients, you know, again, I think this is an opportunity to book your patients in, book them in for their COVID vaccine number one, COVID vaccine number two, influenza vaccine uh, two weeks later. The reason for not co-administering is obvious. If someone does have an adverse event, we need to know whether it's the COVID vaccine or whether it's uh, the influenza vaccine or anything else which, uh, uh, which they may be receiving. Uh, thank you. And that, that ongoing surveillance is a, a critical part of this uh, vaccine rollout, given how new uh, all of these vaccines uh, are. And in fact, uh, some of them, like the Pfizer vaccine, we've never had that class of vaccine before. Um, can I just go on to residential aged care facilities? So we've already heard uh, it's going to be Pfizer vaccine. It'll be uh, contracted companies going out and, and accessing those facilities to, to uh, deliver the vaccines rather than the usual GP. Um, the questions are around what about visitors or family? Uh, they're not currently not allowed to visit if they're not vaccinated. Will that still be the case? So is there any, will there be any priority to family members or residents of residential aged care facilities? And a question around consent, which I guess isn't as relevant if you're not providing the vaccines, but probably still a legitimate question. How are you going to get consent from some of the residents, given how tricky it is for GPs to get consent for various interventions uh, from the residents of aged care facilities? Yeah, great, great question. So uh, firstly, just, uh, just correcting myself a little on phase 1A, although we expect most of the people in phase 1A will get the Pfizer vaccine, some people may get the AstraZeneca vaccine, depending on supply. If we start getting the AstraZeneca vaccine in large volumes, we want to be uh, protecting people as quickly uh, as possible. Uh, we're still uh, to hear what the uh, TGA says about the use of the AstraZeneca vaccine in over 65s. Um, you'll be aware that this is being looked at very closely and there's further clinical trials uh, underway um, in elderly patients, just ensuring the efficacy of the AstraZeneca vaccine in older people. So we'll wait for that 
information to come out as well. Uh, the issue about mandatory vaccines, last year, a number of the states and territories issued uh, public health orders requiring anybody going into a residential aged care to have uh, evidence of an influenza uh, vaccine, current influenza vaccine. Um, that uh, we expect will uh, continue uh, in this coming year uh, for the influenza vaccine, but it's not yet being recommended by the AHPPC for the COVID-19 vaccine for a couple of reasons. The first is we can't mandate the vaccine until we've given everyone the opportunity to have it. Um, secondly, uh, we are not offering the vaccine at this time to children, but we don't want to block children from being able to visit their uh, grandmas and grandpas um, in, uh, in aged care facilities. Thirdly, we don't know yet about the duration of the vaccine and whether the vaccine is going to protect people uh, from being able to transmit COVID-19 to other people. So we may still need to uh, continue uh, the mask wearing and the other uh, precautions which have uh, taken place place uh, in um, residential aged care facilities when we're seeing community uh, cases of COVID-19 occurring, which of course we expect to happen uh, progressively through the year, even while we're rolling out uh, the vaccine. It's why it's so important uh, for all AMA members. Uh, firstly, anybody who you see who has symptoms of cold, flu, fever, fatigue, do a COVID-19 test. Um, it's essential that we're not missing uh, cases. Uh, and secondly, uh, make sure your patients are aware that even though they've been uh, immunised, they still need to be adhering to the COVID normal practices, which we've all been practising uh, while we uh, move through vaccinating the entire population. That's going to be a pretty tough message to convince people of, I suspect, as, as it rolls out. Um, can I go now, uh, just maybe five more minutes. Um, there's been a question about around consumables and uh, PPE. It's certainly something that the AMA was supportive of, of being uh, provided given, especially with these multi-dose vials, given the huge demand that was going to be. Uh, so if you could um, uh, describe what, what's planned there. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the, the details are not yet uh, released, but we're planning uh, to provide um, consumables uh, for um, for the vaccination uh, program. Exactly what elements of the PPE are going to be provided, I can't uh, give you the details. It's one uh, question I'll have to take uh, on uh, notice. Uh, there is an issue around the syringes which are being used to draw up uh, some of these vaccines and whether um, we should be using um, the, the low uh, residual volume uh, syringes, so we actually get more doses uh, of the vaccine out of some of these multi-dose vials. Uh, there'll be more information uh, coming out about that and decisions uh, about that over the next few weeks, uh, hopefully as the vaccines start to arrive uh, in the country. Um, so I think the, the issue about consumables and PPE is one that we are going to need to uh, take on notice and make sure it's in the um, frequently asked questions that come out over the next week or so. Um, can I just go to consent uh, briefly, Chris, if you could start with this one and then, um, uh, Michael, um, we, it, it's been a topic of much discussion between the AMA and, and government as to just how complex the process of consent is. Um, we, we suggested uh, for, the, for those who are not vaccine hesitant, the online process would be efficient and will uh, assist GPs in managing the logistics of vaccination. Uh, where are you understanding it's up to and, and what about for your patients who need more than uh, a cursory discussion on, around consent on the day. Um, so I was, yeah, I mean, again, this was a day one issue for us because really uh, there's two parts. Certainly, I'm actually on the distribution group, which is supposed to design this, but I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, some of the consent aspects on Otagi. But, but what I'd say to you is the, the main things for us was to make sure first up that the consent process was uh, robust enough that it would fulfill medical legal obligations of, of true informed consent, that it wasn't just some sort of throwaway type thing that you, know, you just tick in a box. Um, and I think um, in amongst that was the surety that the medical defense organizations had some, uh, had been able to look at this and were actually just um, happy to, um, uh, happy with it. And so we we were very strong about the requirement that they were have been involved in at least looking at these. Now, we haven't actually seen the final version, but uh, the 
they have been, we have actually brought them into this and that's um, our thanks to Penny Brown from Avant particularly who has organized a lot of that. So that's, thank you. I think she's on the chat actually. So that's great. Um, so that's really one important thing. So it's a combination of making it slick, slick enough, but robust enough to be really true informed consent that would actually fulfill our medical legal obligations. Because obviously if we have that surety that it's slick enough, then we're actually, the whole process is a lot slicker. Um, the other part issues were just of indemnity as well. Um, and just to make sure the indemnitizer is happy. Now they've come out and said that they'll cover us, but there's bit, bits that we have been working on behind the scenes to uh, make sure that everybody's happy on that side of things. So, um, and, and so we have actually again brought them into and we have um, um, uh, contacted uh, the, 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 the minister and the government over this issue to find a, a solution to this, to make sure that uh, everybody is, uh, this is all tied and, and wrapped up nicely by the time we get there. Now that gets on to the final thing, which you brought up Omar, which is again, it gets back to this issue about what constitutes reasonable care. Now, um, I, I, there has been a bit of a slight push and pull on the issue about what, when the, where the line is drawn as far as, you know, if it's, it's a complex situation. Now the ones I look at would be a situation where you've got somebody with, who doesn't have, who has limited English with needs third party consent and it, you, know, you don't know their history. And the question is when, when that co-billing would be appropriate in those sort of situations. Another one would be the pregnant group at the moment. Um, and one where, you know, somebody has a particularly complex history where you really do need to go through this properly. Now, again, our, our argument would be, you know, some that mean, much of that would potentially be within uh, co-billing as long as it's appropriate. Um, and that um, that uh, in that situation, again, it would be 80-20, you know, then the, the protection would be 80-20. And then you'd have to actually be able to document your, what you did. And that, that would be normal clinical behavior in the circumstances. Well, again, what we don't want is that everybody attaches a 23 to every COVAX item, because that would be just, uh, that would that would just dis destroy trust in us in terms of what we do there. So I think, I hope I've dealt with the consent, the indemnity issues, and also this co-billing thing. They're all lined up together to some degree. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Marco, did you want to add anything to that? No, I think that's uh, that's terrific. Thanks, Chris. Uh, we ex we're expecting uh, drafts of the, the consent forms to come out from that Otagi working group that Chris mentioned uh, he's taking part in uh, over the next few days. So uh, one final question from me or from somebody via me um, to you, Michael, uh, the issue of eligibility for the vaccine in different uh, uh, parts of the rollout is going to be quite tricky, especially if you don't have an existing relationship with the patient. So how would a DP be expected to prove that a patient does actually work in a healthcare facility or they do have the chronic disease that they say uh, makes them eligible for the vaccine if you don't actually know the patient? And same applies, yeah. I guess, to pharmacies and all the other vaccination hubs that are around the place. Exactly. Uh, really, really good question. And uh, obviously, age is easy. You just produce uh, evidence of, of your age, and that's the major criteria which is going to determine which category people are in. Uh, healthcare workers, uh, if you had your evidence of, of working where you, where you work, uh, your letterhead, your, your, your name badge if you're working in a hospital. Uh, chronic disease, um, it may be that uh, uh, as a GP, if I'm not uh, rolling out the vaccine in my practice, I'll, I'll need to provide a, a note uh, for, uh, for my patient just saying they have this chronic disease which puts them at increased risk. Uh, please make sure that uh, they get in the early uh, group. Um, I think that uh, we're going to have to uh, we're going to, have to be nimble in making sure that we're not denying uh, people uh, who are genuinely in each of these categories from access uh, to the vaccine when it is their turn. But at the same time, making sure that people are not jumping the queue, uh, and we have seen this happening um, overseas uh, quite frequently and quite alarmingly. Uh, and uh, I doubt whether that'll happen quite as much in Australia because it's not a very Australian thing to do. It's not. Can I just say, far, I, know, I, know, yeah. I know we're coming to the end of the yeah. time, but I just want to say a huge thank you to everyone online for the fantastic questions and comments which are being uh, coming through. And can I please implore the AMA to send me 
uh, the questions and the comments so that I can feed this into the work that we're doing. I will be hosting through the Department of Health a, a weekly one hour webinar uh, update on the vaccine for Australia's GPs. So um, we'll uh, share the details with the AMA about when they, those webinars will be happening. So uh, people can uh, join in or watch those uh, in their, at their leisure and, uh, and keep the questions coming because we're gonna be asking lots of questions about this over the coming months. We certainly will, Michael, and uh, I think it's clear for everyone to see that uh, this uh, vaccine rollout is very much a, a work in progress, and like every other part of our response to COVID, uh, we're learning a lot uh, along the way, and we have to be ready. I think you used the word nimble, and I think that that's exactly right. Uh, things can change very quickly, and of course, there's new vaccines coming out. There's new data on the vaccines uh, continuously becoming available, including a very large trial on AstraZeneca at about the time it'll be rolled out in, in Australia. Uh, so uh, I think what we talked about today could well be quite different in six months' time, and um, we will need to continue that, that learning process. Uh, from the AMA, I'd like to thank uh, you, Michael, in particular for your attendance, and, and Chris for, for speaking at the webinar, everyone for uh, their attendance here today. Uh, we as an AMA can uh, only be as good as the feedback we get from our members, so I'd like to encourage everyone to send messages through, um, through email, through your local uh, branches, however you uh, are able to. Uh, with any uh, suggestions or information or feedback and that, that'll help us do our job and we'll of course continue to advocate uh, for uh, the success of this program and of course for the critical role of, of general practice of all of you here today in the program. Uh, we will probably run uh, some more of these as uh, the situation changes and particularly if we can say there are unanswered questions or there are concerns within, within our membership. So I look out for those and um, thank you all for your attendance today. Cheers.